Anyways, Genesis chapter 23, let's finish this passage off first. Genesis chapter 23. If you recall, they exchanged current money with the merchant at Genesis chapter 23 and verse 16. Now at verse 17, in the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, so that's self-explanatory. He bought the uh, Ephron, the Hittite's field, is bought by Abraham. He purchased it. It was located in Machpelah, uh, Machpelah and Machpelah is right before Mamre. That's the explanation. The field and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that were in all the borders round about, were made sure. So he bought everything, the field, the cave that was there in, so in there, that's basically the idea, and even all the trees uh, in the field that were located at the borders surrounding it. They were made sure, so he made sure to buy all those things. Now the explanation and the contradiction for this one uh, let's look at Acts 7, Acts chapter 7. We'll look at Acts chapter 7. So let's conclude some things here with uh, the cave, Machpelah, and then... Uh, I'll go toward this side when I'm going to discuss the Christian church. Now, the contradiction, supposedly, is that Abraham purchased the field. And then cave. Let me know when I'm out of bounds. And notice that there seems to, it seems to not match. It seems to contradict Jacob when he purchased property. Let's look at Acts chapter 7. There are, there's going to be probably four passages that we're going to tur turn to and examine the contradiction. Acts chapter 7. The Bible says at verse, let's see, 10. Okay, we're going to look at verse, uh, actually, a. Uh, it's not over here, 16. I think you're right. Yes, ma'am, thank you, at 16, 15 and 16, 15 and 16. I'm not all there today, so uh, forgive me. All right, so just bear with me today. A little bit groggy today. Acts 7, 15. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. Okay, notice that Jacob was laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought. So it seems to match up with Genesis 23. It's the area that Abraham bought, and it says over into Shechem. Now go to Genesis. Chapter 34, chapter 33, excuse me, chapter 33. Chapter 33. Okay, so he purchased something at Shechem. Genesis chapter 33, verse 19. Notice Jacob bought the property. Well, that seems to be a contradiction. Abraham already bought it, so why does Jacob have to buy it again? It seems like, according to the scholars then, that the Genesis account that there were several authors 
and they were contradicting each other. So then one author uh, wrote this about Abraham, but then another author later on wrote this about Jacob buying uh, the same property, and it seems like the same story. So then Abraham and Jacob would be made up when they purchased the property. That's their rationale. Look at verse 19, Genesis 33, 19. And he, and he, that's Jacob, bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. If you look at verse 18, and Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan when he came from Paddan Aram and pitched his tent before the city. And then, as you know, he already bought the property. Now, this seems to be a huge contradiction because we already mentioned that Jacob, at uh, Acts chapter 7, let's compare the two. Let me put two bookmarks here. If we compare the two, we can see the supposed contradiction. One, as I mentioned before, Abraham bought the property, but no, Jacob was the one who bought the property. And then two, when you look at Acts chapter 7, Jacob was carried to Shechem. And when he was uh, carried into Shechem, he was laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought. So then was it Shechem or was it, when you go all the way back to Genesis uh, chapter 23, was it Shechem or was it in, uh, let's see, Machpelah, yeah. Was, was it in Machpelah or was it in Shechem? That is the question. Uh, the answer is this. The answer is, if you look at verse 16, notice that Abraham bought a sum of money of the sons of Emer, the father of Shechem. Okay, so the reason why Abraham bought it at Machpelah, let's solve the two contradictions here. One is Jacob already bought it. And then two is the location, Machpelah, versus... Shechem. Okay, which is which? When he bought Machpelah, notice that Shechem was not there. He bought it from the father of the people of Shechem. If you look at Acts 7 again, notice it reads, Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. Do you see that there? Okay, so the reason why Abraham bought Machpelah and not Shechem is because the people that he bought it from were the father. They were the father of Shechem. So Shechem basically did not exist yet. That's the idea. Shechem did not exist yet. Remember in Genesis 10, people have a habit of naming a city after their own name? Okay, so it's very possible when he bought Machpelah that it is known throughout history that the city won't stay the same. It can grow. Or like right next door to the other city, they can have another city built. So as time passed by after Abraham bought Machpelah, demographics changed. City demographics changed. Because city demographics changed, now here's a guy named Shechem, who's the, from the offspring of the people of Machpelah that Abraham bought from. He's like, okay, I'm going to name this city after me. So then now that he names the city after him, and remember, the demographic's different now. So because the demographic's different, that's why these places seem to contradict each other, but they're actually the same region. They're actually the same region. It's just common sense when you're to think about history. Cities' name don't last forever. Some, a lot of times they'll change the names, uh, depending on the culture and the timeline. A second answer why Jacob had to buy it is pretty simple, because demographics could change. So because demographics can change, Jacob, when he bought it, he had to confirm 
So it's not like uh, Jacob had to start from scratch and buy the original property. No, Abraham bought the property, but Jacob, he purchased it as confirmation. Why? Because remember, this is from his grandfather. A hundred years has passed by. That's a huge timeline. So you want to make confirmation on that property and your land that your forefathers bought. So it would make sense that Jacob, he bought it. Why? Again, as confirmation. As confirmation. A third explanation, a third explanation that can resolve the contradiction is uh, this side. All right. Thank you. Please always let me know. If you look at Genesis chapter 33, it says in verse 18, And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paddan Aram and pitched his tent before the city. And then the very next verse says that he bought it, right? Now, this might be more simple than you think. Genesis 33, 18 and 19, when Jacob bought that property, that, that's not the same thing that Abraham bought which might explain why the property names were different. <laughs> and then uh, why, uh, why the names Abraham versus Jacob are different too. Why? Because they both bought different properties. <laughs> it's that simple. Now, if you look at Acts 7, this is so, uh, they didn't read the verse. If you look at Acts 7, it says, verse 15, so Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Jacob bought or Abraham? Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emer, the father of Shechem. See, they associate Acts 7 with Genesis uh, thir uh, 33. They associate Acts 7 with Genesis 33 where Jacob bought the property. But, they have, but there's no relationship whatsoever. The only relationship would probably be Shechem. That's the reason why at verse 16. It's probably because of Shechem. But the simple... Uh, the simple explanation is that Machpelah is within the location where she comes at. It's that simple. So there's multiple explanations for this supposed contradiction. Well, I have a question for PhD scholars. Why do people... Uh, I've heard these kind of alternative explanations from uneducated people who have no degrees and didn't probably even graduate from high school, they just read the Bible, and then they can come up with these alternative explanations, and you PhD scholars can't figure that out? You guys got to be incredibly stupid or incredibly biased against the Bible. But I'll be nice, all right? I won't dare accuse you of having some kind of agenda against us, so I'll just call you stupid, all right? All right. Let's look at Genesis 23. Genesis 23. That's my nice way. I'm being so nice to them. They're stupid PhD scholars, man. That's so sweet, isn't that, brother? That's so sweet. With cherry on top of that sugar? Okay. All right. Genesis chapter 23, and then we'll look at verse 18. Unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth. Okay, notice so many words are spe specified here. It's as if the Holy Spirit is presenting a legal matter, like a contract, buying certain property terms. So the, the Bible is filled with all sorts of different languages, not just scientific, not just mathematical, but even uh, legal terms, believe it or not. Uh, it's very specified to make sure of things. If you look at verse 18, unto Abraham, uh, so all these things, the trees, the cave, the field, Unto Abraham. To Abraham, it, was, it gave to him for a possession. And it was as an eyewitness testimony in the presence, the audience, of the children of Heth. Before all that went in at the gate of his city. So the people, including all the people that went in and out at the gate entrance of the city. And remember, the gate of the city is known for legal matters. For carrying legal matters. So the location was also presented and specified. Verse 19, And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah. That's self-explanatory after 
uh, the legal proceedings, Abraham buried his uh, wife in the cave at the location of the field of Machpelah. Before Mamre, so it's like right before the presence of Mamre. Remember, Mamre was where Abraham lived. Mamre was where Abraham lived, so it was not far. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. Notice right there at the last part of verse 19, Mamre is also another name for Hebron. And I've already explained that sometimes when there's different location names, different location names, it doesn't mean a contradiction. It sometimes there are multiple people in different localities giving it different names. Amen. That happens, that happens. Like uh, a lot of people will know my wife to be uh, Min Jung, or they'll call her uh, Sister Kim or Samonim, and I give her a different name, and no, you, have, you don't have my permission to give her that name. But see, just because that's just normal nowadays. So four or five different names from different people, uh, different backgrounds, cultures, localities. And that can be the same thing with Abraham when he purchased the property versus Jacob. That can be the same thing, especially when you have 100 years. Oh, yeah, there's going to be a bunch of different names. Don't tell me it's all going to be the same. Even Acts 7, I, I just have to keep parking it there a little bit, but even Acts 7, Shechem, you notice, is spelled differently from Genesis. Yeah, yeah. See, when you give it time, things change. That's just common sense. You dumb scholars, you, <laughs> you should know that. Okay, Genesis 23. We'll look at verse 20. And the field, uh, and the cave... That is therein, so the field, including the cave, that is in there, that's the idea, were made sure unto Abraham for a possession. It was Abraham made sure that he got it for his possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. So by the sons of Heth, nearby their locality, around their area, Abraham possesses that burial. Okay, chapter 24, chapter 24. So we resolved the contradiction. Now let's come across this amazing story. Uh, let me know if I'm out of bounds, please, all the time, okay? Genesis chapter 24, verse 1. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. So obviously Abraham is a very old man. He's getting up in years. Stricken, remember I mentioned to you before that English word is commonly used when it's talking about up in years, it's increasing, well up in years. That's the idea. Well stricken in age. So his age, his years are going really high up. So he's getting old where he's about to pass away sometime. We don't know when. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So the Lord blessed Abraham with all sorts of things, all kinds of things. So he had pretty much everything he needed. Verse 2, And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had. So Abraham summoned the, what they called the primary servant of his own household. And he was the guy in charge of everything that Abraham had. He ruled over everything he had. Now we can guess uh, who this servant is. One is it's the eldest servant of the house and it ruled over everything that he had. If you remember that, then when you compare with Genesis 15, you compare with Genesis 15, we definitely know who this guy is. So this guy is undoubtedly Eliezer. The clue is because he is the servant, the servant, that would rule over everything in Abraham's place. Okay, now that we understand that, look at Genesis 15. The verse says at verse 2, And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house? Okay, that's the primary servant. That's what steward is, the one who's in charge of everything. Is this who? Eliezer of Damascus. Uh, verse 4 Verse 4, uh, uh, verse 3, excuse me, verse 3. And Abram said, Behold to me, thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in mine house is mine heir. So we see that Eliezer is undoubtedly 
the servant that Genesis 24 is speaking about. All right, go back, go back. First clue. It has a beautiful picture of the church, okay? So one is Eliezer. You might say, why so? Because he pictures the Holy Spirit. He pictures the Holy Spirit. Actually, I'm going to put it up here since Eliezer's up there. But Eliezer typifies the Holy Spirit, and you might say, why is that? Because Eliezer, you know what it means? It means uh, uh, God is my helper. God is my helper. Now, doesn't that match? Go to John 16, John 16. John 16, who's the one who helps the church to know more about the Son, huh? the only begotten Son of God? If you know the story of Isaac and Rebekah, the story goes that Eliezer, he is the helper or the guide for the Rebekah, the bride of the only begotten son of the father, Abraham. And he is the one that lets her know many things about the only begotten son, that guides her, helps her to have a relationship with the only begotten son of the father, Isaac. Hey, it pictures a lot with the Holy Spirit guiding and helping the church to... Uh, have a relationship with the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. So there is your first picture in Genesis 24. John chapter 16, it's the Holy Spirit's job at verse 13. 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you, see that, into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. Look at verse 14, he shall glorify me. So it's his job to develop that relationship with you and Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And Eliezer, that's his job, to develop that relationship uh, with Rebecca and, uh, and Isaac. All right, going back to Genesis 24. Genesis 24. Now, Bible scholars always have a perverted mind or a biased mind because they just want to find something wrong with the Bible. If you look at Genesis 24, 2, Abraham uh, is speaking to Eliezer, right? He says, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. So Abraham wants uh, Eliezer to uh, put his hand under his thigh, whatever that means. Abraham said, I pray thee. So that means I beseech you. So I plead with you, uh, put your hand under my thigh. Why? Because of verse 3. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth. Because Eliezer is going to swear. Abraham said, I'm going to make you swear by the Lord. The Lord who is what? God of heaven and earth. When he's making a, a promise or an oath, he put his hand underneath the thigh. Now, why is that? So then the scholars, they try to... Uh, put it as some kind of grotesque part of the body. But no, the idea is, it's pretty simple. So uh, we would talk about the thigh here and then under the thigh like this. So the idea is putting the hand over there. It's that simple. Uh, why do scholars want to think more pervertedly? I don't know. And I guess they assume that there was a thigh bone during the time of the Old Testament and that the Old Testament authors knew human anatomy and scientific terms, and that's what they meant by thigh, right? Come on, man. These scholars, they're such a joke, okay? They're such a joke. Uh, if we're going to talk about under the thigh, which is under the leg, it's uh, pretty uh, well known in the Bible that the strongest part, or one of the strongest parts of a man's body is where those upper legs are located. So that's where the strength lies. So the reason why uh, he wants, or Abraham wants Eliezer to put an oath and put his hand underneath the thigh is because that's the strongest part of the body, and he wanted him to 
as a man putting the oath on the strongest type, uh, strongest part of the body to make an oath. Now, I want you to look at the book of Psalm. The book of Psalm. We're going to look at the book of Psalm 147 and verse 10. Psalm 147 and verse 10. Notice right here that the scriptures talks about the strength of a man is located at his legs. Look at Psalm 147, verse 10. The Bible reads, He delighteth not in the strength of the horse, he, take, uh, he taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. Now notice that it's pretty obvious from context here that it's talking about the strength of a man, all of his strength. That's why people, when they work out, they emphasize a lot about working out the upper leg here, right? Why? It does something to the testosterone and then it builds up muscle. So that's the strength of a man. But an obvious one, this is even more plain, is Jacob himself. Go to the book of Genesis, chapter 32. Genesis 32. Now think about it. When Jacob was wrestling with the angel of the Lord, God had to touch Jacob's thigh. When he touched his thigh, why did he do that? So that he doesn't have his strength. So then, obviously, it's talking about this part of the body then. That's why he was hobbling the rest of his life. Now, I don't get it why scholars knew that one. I mean, do you think it was his sexual organ, like the scholars are trying to point out with under the thigh? No, that's stupid. Then how did Jacob reproduce children, right? So that's a really dumb thing to say. So obviously, it's talking about the muscle right here. Now look at Genesis 32, and we'll look at uh, verse 25, 25. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So that's pretty obvious. Look at verse 31. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Well, that's pretty obvious then. Uh, we know what part of the body God was aiming for and what Abraham was talking about. Now let's go to Genesis 24. Genesis 24. Let's look at Genesis chapter 24. Now what does Abraham want from Eliezer to swear? Genesis 24.3, the Bible says that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. He makes Eliezer swear that he will not take a wife for Abraham's boy from the daughters or the women of the land of Canaan where, uh, where Abraham is living amongst. Now you can see that Abraham was not a very good neighbor. <laughs> so imagine uh, telling uh, his boy, no, you're not going to marry one of these people. So you talk about huge segregation discrimination. Now, remember, when we started at Genesis chapter 9 and 10, we could see that God's, it wasn't laid out clearly, the rule. The rule is definitely clear under the Mosaic Law, that you cannot marry anybody outside of your own nationality. The Mosaic Law was very clear, that the New Testament it became more obscure. In Genesis chapter 9, However, we see that it wasn't clearly laid out, but we could see that when God commanded them to spread out throughout the earth, the obvious intention was, I don't want you mingling with each other. I want you to spread out. So I already explained that in Genesis 9 and 11. I explained that thoroughly. That was the original intention. Then Genesis chapter 12, it was pretty plain that God, he wanted a separate new people. So he wanted a segregated new brand of people because the whole world just got corrupt from what Nimrod did from the Tower of Babel mess. So because that was God's intention was to start a brand new people that would be holy and pure, untainted from the world, that's the reason why, that's the reason why Abraham knew that and said to Eliezer, you're going to make sure it's going to be kept that way when he said that at verse 3. Let's look at verse 4. 
Uh, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So Abraham tells Eliezer, you're going to go to my country. So back to his homeland, his home place where he left, and to my kindred. So Abraham's family line. And take a wife unto my son Isaac. So he's going to pick a wife from that family line for his son Isaac. So notice it's within the family tree. Uh, remember at the timeline of Moses, I'm not going to explain it again because I've explained it so many times. Genesis has a problem uh, where critics point out that there's this inbreeding going on. So it's pretty grotesque. But I already explained that during the timeline of Genesis was very different from the time of Moses, especially to today. And not only that, when you're arguing about morals, you're kind of funny when you don't believe in morals yourself and argue that it's relative. And if you want, to, the reason why you don't want to argue for morals, I know why. If you argue for morals, you have to argue for the existence of God. So then when we see these, uh, this so-called inbreeding versus the Mosaic time, how they perform marriage, and the New Testament time when they perform marriage, it just shows that there has to be a standard or an authority there who can make the morals as we go. So that just proves the existence of God. It doesn't you know, they try to point out what's wrong with God, but every time they try to point out what's wrong with God, it's like they're demanding there has to be a God in order to prove that it has to be wrong. If there is no God, you can't prove it to be wrong. That's good. That's good. So when they give these arguments, always catch that. It's always cl clever. It's laid out for you. Basically, every time they argue what's wrong with your Bible or with God, they're demanding there has to be a God, there has to be a Bible. <laughs> Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 23, uh, 24, excuse me. And then verse 5, And the servant said unto him, Peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Eliezer, the servant, obviously would respond this. Well, uh, what if the woman is not willing to follow me all the way back to this land, to the land of Canaan? Peradventure means what if. That's the idea. So Abra uh, Eliezer is saying to Abraham, well, what if the woman is not willing to follow me all the way to this land where you and I are at, Abraham? What if she's not willing to make that long trip? Verse 5 continues reading, Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land? So from whence thou camest? The interpretation, Eliezer is asking, uh, Must I, do I have to, needs bring thy son so is it necessary for me to bring your son to the land where you came out abraham the idea is should i uh will it be necessary when worse comes to worse that i'll have to bring isaac to your homeland abraham so that he can uh marry a good woman there but verse six and Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou bring not thy son, my son, hither again. So Abraham says to Eliezer, Beware, all right? So he warns him, Don't, uh, Do not bring my son thither. So thither means over there. Do not bring my son over there again. He doesn't want to go back to his homeland. Now, this is kind of a little bit... Uh, this is not part of the lesson, but I see something very important here for people who want to think about marriage or relationship. Uh, the mind within people is they want to get married or, uh, or develop a relationship. That's why they'll date early at an early age and then develop relationships. But always in dating, I guarantee you this, with the world, it's, it doesn't start, start with one and end with one. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six... By the time you went through several relationships, whether you mean to or not unconsciously, those women you've been around with, you carry that with you and then it affects your current relationship, whether you believe it or not. But that does so unconsciously. Even psychologically, if you were to study that, there is something there. Why? A relationship is something biological. It is scientific. Uh, there are too many numerous studies among science that intimacy, even with a baby and a mother, or etc., uh, that even animals have it, like there's some kind of signal and understanding once intimacy starts. 
and then it's carried as if it's becoming one body. Why do you think God says that when you get married, two become one flesh? There's something more, that's very scientific in turn. It's not just poet, poetry language there. Yeah, that's good. That's good. It's very scientific there, even psychological. So that's the problem with people nowadays. But one, you'll notice right here that at uh, chapter 24, Isaac waited for the right time. He waited a long, long time before he was able to marry Rebekah. I think he was in his late 30s or maybe even uh, low 40s that time. But he was still able to marry a beautiful woman, one. Number two, you'll also notice that he had a lot of uh, disadvantages. Isaac can't just marry whatever woman he wants to. It has to be completely segregated as God's own people. So this shows a Christian marriage, so to speak. You're only going to marry a saved believer. Secondly, you'll also notice the disadvantage that he can't uh, move wherever he wants to. He has to stay where God calls him to stay. And then the woman has to follow God's will in being called out when she gets called out. Now, you to notice a total disadvantage here, but that's how right marriage is done and how God's going to uh, bless a family. If your marriage or your relationship don't start like that, that's the reason why you're struggling right now if you didn't start out that way. So that's why it's so important to start out right first. That way later on, God's blessing can be sh poured upon earlier and then the marriage can become smoother. If not, then you have to clean house right now, and that's the reason why your relationship is still a struggle. Now, I know that we don't, uh, I, I don't have like uh, teenagers here yet, but once we, get the, uh, once we have a huge amount of young people and teenagers, that's why it's so important to not rush things. And, you know, let's be honest, young adults, we do act like teens still. Even a lost secular psychologist, even like Jordan Peterson, mentioned that we are now living in a day and age where uh, uh, people who are 30-year-olds are still acting like teenagers. And then once they hit 40, then they start to mature. But that mat maturation process should have started during college years when they're preparing for job and life and something in the future. Okay, anyways, uh, let's go back to Genesis 24. I digress. I got to stick to the text here. But there's a lot of rich stuff here about relationships, uh, dating, and marriage in Genesis 24. Uh, Lord willing, I'll give a teaching on that. But uh, not right now. Verse 7. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house uh, and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, okay, that's a lot of language there. So Abraham saying, the Lord God of heaven, he, the, one, the God of heaven, who he's the one who took me from my homeland, my father's house. He's the one that took me from the land of my kindred, my relatives, my close loved ones. He's the one who spake to me. And when he spoke to me, he also swore to me. He put his oath to it. He made a promise to me saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. So Abraham saying, God put an oath to, uh, swore to me that the land of Canaan, that that was going to be my land and my generation's land, Isaac's land. Which means Isaac cannot move out and dwell in a different land. God already made an oath. This is going to be where you're at. This is your land. And so Abraham had to trust God and say, no, Isaac can't go. He's going to stay. So this is really uh, not just a blind dating. This is a blind marriage. Rebecca has to go totally out by faith, trusting the Lord, and say, this is the man for me. And then the man Isaac had to totally go out by faith and say, this is the woman for me. Uh, well, I, 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 that's just too much, Pastor. And well, that, that's your problem is that you, don't tr you think God is blinder than you. So you need your eyes to make the judgment, not the Lord. Look, God knows more than you. I trust his eyes more than yours. I certainly trust his eyes more than mine. Let's look at uh, verse 7 again. 
he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. So Abraham says to Eliezer, <coughs> God's going to send his angel before you, so don't worry, everything will be taken care of. So he'll take care of everything. And you are going to take and find a wife for my son's son from thence, from over there. Verse 8, and if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Wow, that's a lot of faith, Abraham. What did he say here? He said, if the woman's not going to be willing to follow you, to leave her homeland and all the way here to the land of Canaan, then you're going to be clear from my oath. So the, where you swore to me, uh, by putting your hand underneath my thigh, you'll be uh, clear from that oath if she don't follow you. Only bring not my son thither again. That's pretty strong. He says, what, just do not bring my sons to that land, okay? You can even be free from this oath if the woman don't follow you. Now, that's a lot of faith Abraham had in the Lord. I don't know how many of you have that kind of faith at verse 8, especially in your relationship life. You always have to have a plan. You always have to have everything set up and then the, the right feeling and everything. No, you cannot do that. You got to put your trust in the Lord. Well, I, you know, I got to go to that land. I got to go to that unsafe place. I got to do that worldly thing. No, 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 no. Abraham was so adamantly against it. He said, no, anything but that. You can even be clear from the oath. Abraham was that adamant. Why? Because he had that much faith that God would provide for it. Why? Because God said that uh, your seed is going to be numerous as the sand of the sea. Abraham had so much faith. Why? He already sacrificed his Isaac. I wonder how many of you did that. Good. See, when you experience that sacrificing of Isaac, that unexplainable faith comes out in everything in life. And if you're struggling with uh, having faith in the Lord in your relationship, then I would dare say you did not sacrifice your Isaac yet. It might be a good time to do that. Isaac went through that experience too. Remember, he was, had to be willing to lay down his life so that Abraham could sacrifice him because he was more strong than Abraham. Did you sacrifice your Isaac yet? If not, then you're not going to have a happy relationship later on a marriage or, God forbid, later on a family and then grandchildren after that. That's why it's always best to start out right, okay? It's best to start out right so that the rest can come out right. You start out wrong, the rest will come out wrong, and no matter how hard you try to clean it up or patch it up, guess what? Those wrong things will still be there. It's hard to change something that's wrong. You might say, how do you know that? Because you're the evidence. You grew up in an environment and so used to living in an environment of wrong, you think your children are going to do better than you? You parents have so much faith in your children <laughs> more than the Lord. That's just mind-boggling to me. Mind-boggling. You have so much faith in your children. They'll be okay. They won't mess up. You send them to public school. You let them watch God forsaken stuff. And you let your relationship be messed up so that when your kids mess up, oh, later on in life, they'll mature. They'll grow up. And, and they can come out worse than you. Okay, enough preaching. Back at uh, verse, verse 9, verse 9, enough preaching. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master. So the servant, he puts his hand under the thigh of Abraham, and Abraham's his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. So concerning the matter of everything Abraham talked about, Eliezer swore. Now begins the romantic story at verse 10. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master. Nothing important. You know, numbers are not that important in the Bible, if you're a Bible believer. So the servant selected, you know, by, by just sheer random chance, ten camels out of the camels of uh, Abraham, his master. Now, ten, if you know in your Bible, ten is a Gentile number. Oh, another picture here. The church, when God switched the program for the church being his bride, he switched from Jew to who? Gentile. Gentile. Thank you. Look at that. Look at that. 
There's something going on in this marriage that God's about to do. So it's amazing how Eliezer went by the number 10 when he started his journey to find a bride. Can I get a running of the aisles there? What did you mean by that? The Holy Spirit went by a number 10 as he started its journey to pick up the church bride of Jesus Christ. Evidence, Acts chapter 10. He started the Gentiles to be included within the church. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. 10 is a Gentile number. And notice that's when God's program switched from Jew to Gentile. Acts chapter 10. Notice verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. So notice that the Italians were the first to start off with the Gentile church. And this was uh, pretty big to the Jews because they're like, why would God pour out his Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles? But Peter explained to them that it's not just the Jews. Now God poured it on the Gentiles. Look at Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Notice at verse, let's see here, 17. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us. So Peter's saying, just like God gave the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles like he did to us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God granted also to the Gentiles, granted repented, repentance unto life. Notice at verse, 16, uh, verse 15, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. So, the Holy, so Eliezer, at Acts chapter 10, chose to come down at that time to start the journey for the bride. Amen. Okay, let's go back to Genesis. There's a lot of rich pictures here. A lot of rich pictures. Returning to our main text, Genesis 24, and then verse 10, and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hand. So Eliezer took 10 camels and left the land and had all the goods, all of his master's goods at his disposal. So at, in his hand, that's the idea, the phrase, at his disposal. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. So Eliezer got up, went to Mesopotamia uh, unto the city of Nahor. Remember at Genesis 22 laid the groundwork of Nahor. That's from Abraham's family lineage. So he's going to Mesopotamia where Abraham's family is located. Nahor city. So Nahor is going to be an important character, that means. So he's going to be brought up in the future. Verse 11, and he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening. So then the servant made his uh, camels kneel down without the city. So that's outside of the city. So you'll notice at this picture here, the camel is uh, outside the city. Uh, let's see right here. Verse... Uh, I just lost my uh, point here. Oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, by a well of water at the time of the evening. So at the evening time, so I try to draw it out as best as I can. So it looks like evening time here. And then he's by a well of water. That's where his camel stopped. Even the time that women go out to draw water. So notice it's at the time, the right time. Like Eliezer came at the right time. High time as, hey, here's a high chance where women are going to come out to draw water from the well, and then I can pick the right woman. So notice that the Holy Spirit has no problem at the right time, at the best time where he can find the right mate. So always trust the Holy Spirit, not your own flesh. Amen. Always trust the Holy Spirit, not your own flesh. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day. So he's praying to God. He says to God, 
the God of my master, Abraham, I'm praying to you. So good speed, that's another word for God's speed. Now, a lot of Christians always say good luck, but you don't want to say that. We don't believe in luck. A word that replaces good luck, actually, is actually God's speed, also known as good speed. That's the same thing as good luck, but we don't believe in chance or luck. We believe in God. That's why we say God's speed. See that? Because we believe in God. So next time, if you want to uh, wish someone good luck, don't say good luck, say God's speed. You want to say God's speed. So he says, uh, please give me God's speed. At this day, today, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. So the servant's uh, begging and praying to the Lord, please show kindness uh, for my master Abraham, where basically the Lord can send good speed and find the right woman out of kindness for uh, his servant, uh, for his faithful servant Abraham. So that's what Eliezer is praying for, for Abraham's sake. Would you show kindness? Verse 13, behold, I stand here by the well of water. So behold, that English word has been commonly used throughout Genesis. That's an that's uh, the word that always introduces to pay attention to what I'm about to say here. That's the idea. Eliezer is saying, I'm standing here by the well of water, God, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. Eliezer says, uh, the women from the men of the city, so the daughters of the men from the city are coming out here to draw water, to pick up water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, so Eliezer says, let it happen. That's the idea of let it come to pass. So I want this to happen that uh, if it turns out the damsel, so the young lady, uh, that who, this young lady that I'm going to say, what? Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So Eliezer says, the woman who's going to come to this well, and uh, I'm going to say to her, please uh, use your pitcher right here to draw water. I pray thee, so I urge you, uh, please give me water to drink. And also, if she says, if she responds, drink, but not only will she say drink, but she'll also say, and I will give thy camels drink also. The woman is not just going to say, yes, I'll give you water to drink, but she's going to be so considerate because that's how you mothers and wives are. Amen? <laughs> or anyone under conviction from that one? <laughs> All right? So that's how you wives, you mothers should be. Considerate. Why? Because a considerate role is so important for nurturing. For nurturing. It's very important for that. And that's your role, women, as the nurturing role. You might say, why is that? Because of the, uh, ba the baby that's going to be born out of your life. Not because of gender, stere gender stereotyping. No, it's because of a scientific biological fact, yeah. all right? Yeah. We guys can't do that. That's a, uh, did I offend someone? You guys cannot get pregnant. Amen. Can I repeat that again? Amen. All right? You guys can. I don't care how many surgeries you have. Yeah. Have all the surgeries in the world. You're not God. You can't create life like that. So you guys can't do that. So women can. That's why because of that, it's a biological factor where there's that nurturing side. A woman is more close with that baby, believe it or not, than the daddy. Believe it or not. Uh, let's see right here. So then, because of that consideration that woman would have that, hey, uh, you know what? I'll also give your camel's drink too. Now, you know how much work that's going to be? You know how much water a, camel's drink, a camel drinks? One camel? But he's, he brought a train of camels with him. All right, that's going to be some woman to say that. Notice Eliezer had the faith of Abraham. That's a good influence Abraham had. He gave a good influence to that whole household. He gave that much influence to his son Isaac. He gave that much influence to his servant Eliezer. Why? Because he's been watching his master. Oh, what faith that uh, our church would be like that too. Yeah. And that I hope that this pastor here could give that kind of influence and that you guys can have that as well. We all need to work on that. We all could work on that one. 
It's quite a faith Eliezer had that the woman who does that, verse 14, let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. So let that same woman be the one that you chose, you appointed for your servant Isaac to marry. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And from this, so thereby, the idea is, so from out of this, I'll know that you showed kindness to my master Abraham. He knew how to pray. He knew how to pray. Uh, I think that this is one example of prayer. Uh, I have a lot of teachings, ideas on prayer, but this is one passage on prayer that you want to pray for good speed. Good speed. You want to pray for good speed. And also for the Lord to show kindness. For the Lord to show kindness. So how you get answered prayer, remember, is you uh, basically, oh, I'll just say it, that you basically bet it on his attribute. Remember, when you bet it on his attribute, you get better answered prayers, right? So he bet it on the attribute of God's kindness here. That's what happened. Now, that's a lot of faith uh, that he had. Let's see. Uh, I want to cover this. So I'll just cover it now. Go to John 4. Now another picture. Go to John 4. I'll cover it now. John 4. Another picture. It shows Jesus Christ who asked for water to drink from a Samaritan woman. From a Gentile. You notice that? That Samaritan woman pictures, it really pictures us, the church. And then here's Jesus who asked water to drink, but actually we're supposed to be the ones. Actually, Gentiles are supposed to ask the Lord for water to drink. Now let's look at the book of John 4. And it's by a well, as usual. I'm sure the Lord Jesus Christ, he was thinking of Genesis 24 when this happened. Amen. I'm pretty sure. Genesis chapter 24, uh, Genesis chapter 4, excuse me, verse 6. Now Jacob's uh, well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Verse 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? Verse 10, This is quite something. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest, thou wouldest have asked of him. And he would have given thee living water. Notice that the bride, the church, is to ask for water. Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Revelation 22. How humbling. Uh, isn't the Holy Spirit the one who offers water? Eliezer typifies the Holy Spirit. He's the one that gives water. But it's amazing that he has to ask the church for water to drink instead. Look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. And the what? Spirit and the bride. I'm sure God had in mind Eliezer and, Re and Rebekah. Come and let him that heareth say, Come and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. There's no doubt a connection of the picture of the Holy Spirit and the bride with all of this, with asking water. It's rich with pictures. Okay, so we end right here. There's a lot more pictures in Genesis 24 about the church. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much uh, for your book. It's a blessed book. It's a holy book. And even the pictures, not just the words, but the pictures in it is amazing where it teaches something valuable and sacred and what we can apply to our lives. I pray that we will truly feed on your words and continually grow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.